the first. Who? Just me. Oh my goodness. I don't know what I'm saying. I think I do know what I'm saying. And she's trying to find the words. So I'll testify. How about that? Until she gets all that taken care of. So. The Lord sure has been good to us. Amen. Amen. We've been having good crowds every week. And I'm just praying that God is going to give us a good crowd this Sunday. And, uh, and so if you know somebody. You need to get on the on Facebook. You need to get on social media. You need to get on the phone. Really talk it up. Make sure we get our church full. We don't want to. We don't want to scare the preacher or anything, but we do want to. You know, when the preacher's away, we need to honor the man of God and be able to be faithful to the house of God and the things of God. Can I get a witness tonight? Because guess what? That hit, that encourages him when he's away. You know, it discourages him when there's a shortage on when he leaves. He feels like he can't go nowhere. I've been in his shoes before, and so uh, he feels like he feels like well, he, well, I can't even go on vacation because you know won't nobody come to church. So uh, let's be an encouragement to the preacher. Somebody take a picture on Sunday morning, even if you. Yeah, take a picture, but not this time. Make sure you take a picture of the side that's got the most people. Huh? Uh, well, we just sing, I'd rather have Jesus. That's a good song there.
shall be my king. And a man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved himself there not once, nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. What I want to preach to you tonight, and our main text is going to come out of the upcoming uh, verses here. But what I want to preach tonight is this thought, how to overcome fear. So let's pray and we'll be seated we'll get into this. Father, we love you and thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We thank you for being so good to us, Father. We thank you for this opportunity just to be in your house of worship tonight. What an honor it is to break your scriptures, Father. And what an honor it is just to be here and to learn of these things. Lord, I pray that you'd be with our hearts, Father. You know the hearts of each and every one that's here better than I ever could. And Father, you know what needs are here tonight. And I pray that you'd meet every need according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I want to go over just a little bit of what's happened here in these first couple of verses that we just read, um, and then we'll get into the actual text verses here in just a minute. But the Bible, it starts out in verse number eight, talking about how the king of Syria is warring against Israel. And he has this 
plot uh, to overtake them. And so he finds his place and he tells his, uh, his companions here, he tells them uh, where they're going to be camping at, thinking that, of course, no one has, has heard it, of course. And so he tells them, he's like, we're going to be camping here. And then somehow, you know, God worked in, in Elisha's heart here and revealed where they're going to be camping at. So he goes and he, of course, tells the king of Israel, he's like, this is where they're going to be camping at. This is what God has shown me. And here they are, they, they, don't, they avoid this spot that he told them not to go at. And whenever the king of Syria realizes that they're not here, he assumes, he's like, somebody has done, told everybody where we're going to be. And so he rebels against his own people there, and he, he brings them all together, and he says, I want to know which one of y'all is, is going and telling the enemy uh, where we're going to be at. I want to know which one of y'all is, is secretly for them, and you're not really for me. And of course, there was nobody volunteering to, to, to take ownership of that. And so that's whenever one of them speaks up and they're like, there's this preacher. And he's in, he's with Israel. And he, I don't know how, but he's the one that has went and told all these things. And so he says, I want to know where this man's going to be. So he sends out these spies. And they go and they tell him that he's in Dothan. And that brings us exactly to where we are now. He realized that they're in Dothan. And the Bible says that he sent all these horses and all these chariots and this great host of an army to go and to take on Elijah. And this is what God does. I want you to listen to what God does first. He says, and when the servant, in verse 15, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host can pass the city, both with horses and chariots. And the Bible says, And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes and the, of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. And as much as I, I, I love this portion of Scripture so much, it's been, it's been such a blessing to me, and I've, and I've preached on it several times. And I love preaching, uh, just going in detail and just shouting about this thing, but I want to break it down into a little more detail because the message that I have for you tonight is how to overcome our fear. And so to look at that, let's look at verse number 15. Let's go down just a, let's break it down just a little farther. The Bible says, when the man, uh, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And so I don't know about you, but whenever I read the Bible and whenever I get into these these accounts like this, these individual accounts, I like to just imagine this in my head. And I don't know about you, but I'm imagining just them, them in the mountains here, because we find out later they're in the mountains. I'm imagining them here in the valley of this mountain. And maybe they just got just a little rinky-dink tent. I'm sure they wouldn't stay in a no five-star hotel or anything like that. I'm imagining them in this little rinky-dink tent here, just camping out, waiting for orders from God. And here the enemy has done conspired against them. And we know that it was early in the morning. And by the way, let me say this. A lot of times, uh, while you're sleeping, the enemy's working. While you're sleeping, the enemy's working. Never think just because you're sleeping doesn't mean that the devil isn't at work. He is, after all, the prince and the power of the air. And a lot of times we wake up first thing in the morning and the enemy's already got a plan against you and I. Yeah. So he woke up in the morning. He pulls back these curtains. And I'm sure he already thought in his mind what he was going to see that morning. I'm sure he thought he was going to see sunshine, and I'm sure he thought he was going to see the birds out there playing and the little squirrels out there playing or something like that, something like you'd see in some kind of Disney movie. But instead, here he is. He opens up the doors of this tent, and what does he see? He sees the enemy surrounding them. The Bible says that they can pass on. And in case you're wondering, this word compass is literally where we get our word compass. And what it means is that it, they had them surrounded on every single side. 
And so here he is. He woke up in the morning. I'll illustrate this for you just a little bit. He woke up in the morning. I don't know if he was like myself. A lot of times whenever I wake up in the morning, you got some people who are just early birds. And you got some people you just don't touch in the mornings. And I'm one of them you don't touch in the mornings. I wake up and I'm not just a big smile on my face as much as I wish I were. I wake up in the morning, it's rough, boy, it's rough. It takes me a while to get in gear. So maybe he's like me, he woke up and here he is rubbing his eyes as he's walking out of the tent. He's still just trying to figure out what in the world's going on, it's too early. He rubs his eyes and there he is just, bam, there's the enemy. He goes, whoa, sorry about that. Bam, there they are again. He goes, well, uh, let me just move out of y'all's way. Bam, bam. The enemy had this guy surrounded. And these weren't nice people. These were people who were angry because here they had all these plans to overtake Israel and they got ruined by just one man. They are angry. They're out for blood. They want to get this thing resolved or it's their neck to the king of Syria. And here they are angry with them. They've got these chariots. They've got swords. They've got spears. They've got an army. And they are literally on every single side. And this is where he gets so afraid that he turns and he says, Master, here he goes back into the tent. Maybe Elijah's still asleep. He don't realize all this is going on yet. He pokes his head out, sees all this going on. He pokes his head back in the tent. He said, hey, look, we got a problem out here. This thing ain't going to go our way. What are we going to do? And listen to Elijah's response. And think about how happy you'd be with your preacher if he said this to you whenever you told him there's an army uh, just surrounding you on every side. He looked at him and he just said, fear not. Because there's more of us than there are of them. I'm sure at that point, I don't know exactly how I would have reacted, but I'd like to say if I was the servant in this situation, that I would instantly count heads. Because this man done told us there's more of us than they are of them. At this point, I'd be like, all right, let's count this out. One, two, skip a few, 99, 1,000. One, two. Your math ain't math and right, preach. <laughs> but he told them to fear not. And tonight, God is telling us the same thing. Because as I said, while we were yet sleeping, we wake up in the morning surrounded some days. We wake up in the morning, and before we even get a chance to step foot out our house, problems are already waiting on. Sometimes before I even get into work in the mornings, I've already got more problems than I do me. And some of you are maybe the same way oftentimes. And here is how we figure out how to stop fearing. What I want to do is preach this message to you in, uh, in the form of an acronym. And that is, in other words, I'm going to spell out fear to you. F-E-E-R. That's a joke, by the way. I just want to see how many of y'all pay attention to <laughs> What's well, sad is how many people looked at me doing this. You ain't paying attention. You ain't fooling nobody. But no, I want to spell out fear for us. And so to do this, I want us to look at the servant's reactions. Because what we see is a man who has just realized he's in trouble. And a lot of times, we are the fate of how we're going to overcome a trial is found out whenever we first see trouble. And I don't want to pick on them or, or, or make fun of them or anything else because in a lot of ways we'd probably be just like the servant. And many times in our life we are just like the servant whenever problems come our way. But I do want to pick apart what the Bible says about how he reacts whenever he sees sudden apparent danger. And so let's go back here. Verse number 15 towards the very end there. The Bible says, and his, towards the end, it says, And his servant said unto him, He just seen trouble, this is what he says. The first thing he says is, alas. The first thing he says is, alas. And from this, I want to give you the letter F, which is our first reaction. The first way we overcome fear 
is by our first reaction to trouble. And now I've heard it said by a lot of preachers, and I totally back it, I totally agree with it, that it's not exactly how you start, it's how you finish. The Bible tells us to finish well, and a lot of preachers say, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And I've preached that, I believe that. But it's like this, a lot of times on Christmas, us dads are challenged with a very serious task called assembling the presents that our sons and daughters get. For me, it's just sons. Some of y'all got sons, daughters. Sometimes they get these toys, and the, and, the, and, the, and the box will say ages four and up, but that doesn't mean that adults can't, can't struggle assembling this thing. Trust me. Sometimes we get that thing, and they come with the most vague instructions. You'll get this complex toy, and it's just like, oh, yeah, you just put this piece here. All you're going to need is a Phillips head screwdriver and a little bit of common sense. It's like, well, I'm missing one or the other because this ain't happening. <laughs> so a lot of times what us dads do is we take them instructions and we just throw them. And we go at it on our own. We can figure this out. Let me tell you something. I've been a plumber for six years now, and I can plumb in an entire house, no matter how complex it is. There's not very many of them that can stump me, but let me tell you something right now. There's some kids' toys out there where it'd probably pay for me to read them instructions. <laughs> and, but a lot of times we'll throw them away, and then we'll get about halfway through this thing and realize we're in trouble. So what do we do? We go back looking for them and say, where did I throw them things at again? And at that point, you go looking back at step number one, you're like, I messed up right at the very beginning of this thing. And then you got to do a lot of reworking. Let me tell you what's going on in the kid's head. He don't care how you start. He don't care what goes on in the middle. All he cares about is by the end of this thing, whether it was an hour, two hours, three hours, if you assemble it, all he cares about is at the end, he got his tool. Because it's not how you start, it's how you finish. But I will say this. We can save ourselves a lot of heartache in the middle of this thing by starting well. By starting well. It may not all come down to how you start, but I will say it goes a lot smoother when you start well. And I'm going to pick on my wife just a little bit because we, she always says, oh, no, whenever I say that. She don't know what's about to come out of my mouth. I don't go over this stuff with her, y'all. But... Yesterday, we was out uh, working in the yard just a little bit. We was cleaning up a little bit of stuff, threw out some stuff we really didn't need, and she found this little stake that you can hang flowers on, and she tried to drive this thing in the ground, and every time she would, that thing would not end up like this or like this or like this. It would not, she was like, I cannot get this thing to straighten out. She'd get it stubbed in the ground, and she'd be trying to pull it straight. This thing's made out of steel, y'all. <laughs> She tried to pull it straight. She finally just ended up saying, you know what? She goes, I think if uh, I think once we put the flower on it, it'll pull straight. I tried to help her out about halfway through. I actually drove it in the ground straight for her, but she didn't like where it was, so she pulled it up and tried to redo it again, and it still worked. I found that I thought to myself, if she would just drive it in straight from the beginning instead of driving it crooked and trying to pull it straight, it'd work out. But a lot of times, that's how we do it in our lives. We start out all crooked whenever trouble comes our way. We instantly start freaking out and going frantic over the whole thing. We instantly, we lose our faith before it's even there. And then we wonder how it's so hard to pull it back straight once we started out crooked. The bottom line is, it's our first reaction that makes a major difference in how we feel and how we have faith. The, the, when we see this man who opened up his tent doors into all this trouble. And then, before it even really set in, he was already, alas, this huge shout of, of disappointment and discouragement. He was already in his head that this thing was not going to go in his way because he uttered all this fear. The Bible says this in the book of Isaiah. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Which brings me on to my next point here, the letter E here. And let's read these next couple of words that he says. He starts out and he says, alas, and then he says, my master. He instantly starts talking to Elisha. 
this creature, this prophet, this man of God who he had been following his ministry. He said, alas, my master. He went to, he went to the preacher here for help because he was in trouble. And what I want to focus on here is we need to focus on, for the letter E, what's effective in our lives. What is effective in our lives. We get into trouble and a lot of times, us people, we're not known for being logical in whenever we're in trouble. Whenever things suddenly turn to a mess, we're not known for being logical at all times. Prime example, whenever I was a kid, we, I had this friend of mine, and we used to ride these four-wheeler trails together. And, uh, well, we didn't ride them all the time. He invited me to ride this one time. I tried to act like I was like a uh, four-wheel fanatic there. But no, this is just one time. He said, you want to ride a four-wheeler? Here I was a country boy. I was like, yeah, let's do it. I don't get four-wheelers where I came from. We had bicycles. But when he said, you want to ride this four-wheeler? I was like, yeah, let's do this thing. He said, well, we got these trails. They're all cleared out. I'll take you riding. You know, I was like, all right. Well, let me tell you something. They were cut out for him. He stood about this tall. I was born six foot. Here we tear down this trail, and there's a low-hanging limb right there. I didn't see it because I wasn't known for paying attention then. I ain't really known for it now. He said, he said, duck. <laughs> Where? <laughs> wow. Had a nice little gash on my head. Here I was looking for a duck. <laughs> because we're not known for logic whenever there's trouble afoot, okay? And we're like that in our lives. Whenever bad things happen, we don't worry about what's logical. We're not worried about what makes sense. We just know we're supposed to do something. So we just do something. And even if we were known for being logical in times of trouble, there's a whole lot of people out there that don't think that trusting in God is very logical for life's problems. And a lot of these people sit in church people. Sometimes we love to shout about how God is so strong, God is so mighty. We love to sing how great as thou art and raise our hands and shout and clap and everything else. But whenever trouble's afoot, God's not so great anymore, mighty and great. God's not so great anymore. Our friend's advice is, advice is great. We're not so worried about what's effective. And whenever we are, we fail to see what's the most effective thing in our lives. For those of us who know the Bible and know it through and through, we know that the Bible says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. We know that our Bible says, I have been young and now I'm old, and yet have I never seen the righteous forsaken. For those of us who know and trust the Bible, we should know that whenever trouble is afoot, the most logical choice is to run to the one who created the sun and the moon and the stars, who the one who made a sea in the dry land, the one who saved the man from the lion's den, the one who sent three Hebrew children into a fiery furnace and they came out and they didn't even smell like smoke. That's the logical choice. Money can look awful supplying Sometimes in trouble. And sometimes the preacher can look like an awesome choice to turn to. And sometimes the Sunday school teacher can look like an awesome source to come to. Mom and daddy can look like a good choice. Your best friend can look like a good choice. But let me tell you something. Whenever it comes to getting people out of trouble, there ain't none better than the God who made the whole thing. <laughs> we should focus on what's effective. Let's move on because we're getting towards the end of this day. The next thing we want to look at is that we should, A, ask the right questions. He said, alas, my master, how shall we do? And what this literally means, if we was to turn this into uh, our redneck language so that we can understand it, he pretty much turned around and he said, hey, bub, what are we going to do here? He wanted to know what are we going to do. How's this going to play out? And a lot of times, whenever it comes to getting in trouble, a lot of times where we mess up right from the start is not asking the right questions. A lot of times, whenever bad things happen to us, the first thing we want to say is, how can this happen? Why is God doing this to me? Why is this even happening in my life? The 
whole time, God's got it already figured out. We ask the wrong questions. And a lot of times these questions that we ask happen and we ask them because we're already doubtful of how it's going to work out. We're asking, how is this going to happen? It's a totally rhetorical question. We don't care what the answer is. We just know that something bad's happened. We can't do nothing about it and that bad things are going to happen to us. And a lot of times our thoughts, our negative thoughts, and our negative fears, and this not having faith is oftentimes what leads to the bad happening. A prime example is this. Uh, I heard a story once about this man, and I actually used this you know, for the youth just the other week. But there was this man, he got stranded on a dirt road, and he had a flat tire. He was just out on this dirt country road, someplace he'd never been before. He was just traveling to and fro, and broke down with a flat tire. And he was awful discouraged about his flat tire until he looked up and he seen this light off in the distance. It was an old farmer's house. And he was like, well, maybe that farmer will have a love ranch so that I can change my tire. So here he took off on this walk. He was in walking distance. He took off on this walk. He got to walking. And as he got to walking, he started having a little bit of doubt. He thought to himself, what if this farmer ain't got a love ranch? But he pushed on. As he got going up the road a little farther, the doubt started coming on more and more. He started thinking to himself, what if he won't answer the door? But he was like, nah, he'll have one. Look, Rach, he'll answer the door. He pushed on a little bit further and he thought, what if this farmer just won't let me borrow his luck, Rach, because he don't know me from nowhere? He started getting a little angry about it. By the time he made it up to the farmer's door, he went to knock, and his mind said, this man ain't going to let me borrow his love ranch. Infuriated, he turned away and didn't even knock on the door. He said, I can't believe the nerve of that guy. By that time, the farmer opened the door. He said, sir, can I help you? He turned around all angry. He said, listen to me, sir. I wouldn't borrow your love ranch if it was the last love ranch on earth. A lot of times it's our doubts, our negative thoughts, our fears that controls how we act in certain situations. A lot of times just our negative thoughts alone are what leads to our demise. And we think on, the, on Paul, whenever he was in uh, a pretty dramatic moment of his life, God had literally just revolutionized everything that he ever thought or knew on the way to Damascus. He revolutionized this guy's whole entire life in one moment. And Paul in this moment didn't ask, who do you think you are? He didn't ask, how come this is happening to me? He didn't ask, why me, Lord? Why not anybody else who is a leader in this time? But instead, he looked at him and he said, Lord, what will thou? have me do. If we would learn to turn all of our whys and hows and all these negative things into just simply asking God, Lord, this is happening in my life. What do you want me to do? We'd be a whole lot better off. Which leads me right into our last point. And before I get into this, I'd like to ask if uh, somebody would mind coming and playing the piano because I also want to have an altar. As she comes up, we've been talking about how we can overcome fear in our lives. A lot of it deals with our very first reaction, and then it, it deals with focusing on what's effective in our lives, other than focusing on what doesn't work. It deals with asking the right questions. But the last thing that I want to bring out here is actually the simplest of all, but probably the most powerful of all, is that we learn to rely on the Lord. We learn to rely on the Lord. And we talk about this a lot. We talk about relying on God. But we don't always talk about what it means to rely on God. The 
best I've ever heard it explained how we were supposed to rely on God is by Ray Cumber. He talks to people and leads them to salvation a lot of people on the streets. He always talks about trusting in Jesus. And whenever he talks to them about what it means to put faith in Jesus, he always says this. He said, you're supposed to trust in Jesus like you trust in a pair of shoes. Well, let me tell you this. When we get saved and we trust in Jesus like we trust in a parachute, it means we throw our whole lives in His hands. My life's not mine. I can't save myself. I need you to save me. I gotta trust in you. That same trust is just the beginning of our trust in our lives. After we're saved and we go out here and we get into all of this trouble and we get into all of these situations, that's whenever our faith starts getting exercised. And each time we get into trouble, each time problems come our way, we're getting back on the airplane about to jump once again every single time. If we would learn to see our problems whenever they come up in our lives, just like going into a plane about to skydive, we'd be a lot better off. Because each time you're about to jump out of this plane once again, and you've got to make a decision whether you're going to take the parachute with you and trust in it, or are you going to try and go on your own? How many of y'all, by show of hands, would jump out of an airplane without a parachute? Just you? I'm just kidding. Nobody. Why? Because we need the parachute. But many times in our life, we get into problems. We get into situations and we jump out of the airplane all by ourselves. And about halfway down, we realize we need to do something because we're about to go downhill fast. And so we just start flapping our own little hands. Flapping your hands might make you feel good, but it ain't going to slow down the fall at all. And so whenever we realize we can't do it on our own, we holler at our buddies and we try to hook him with us. And we realize that that only makes us fall faster. So the next time we jump, we try to bring the preacher down with us. Maybe he'll help us out a little bit. And we realize that we still just fall faster. Some of you try to hook your husband and your wife to you, hoping that that'll make things a little better. It might make you feel better. You might have somebody to talk to, but you're still falling. We soon realize that the only thing that's going to help is relying on Jesus. And I've never heard this explained better than I did in Jeremiah 33 and 3. Jeremiah said, Call unto me. Call unto me. All ye that labor that are heavy laden. For he said, Call unto me. He said, I will answer. And let me tell you, Jeremiah could have stopped it there and not wrote another thing, and it would have been just fine with me. But he goes on to explain why you should call on him. He said, call unto me. He said, I'm going to answer thee, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. God said, I'm going to take this situation you're in. I'm going to take this problem you're going through and I'm going to show you something you never thought could be done before. You don't believe me? Why don't we go back to the Israelites who stood at the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army trying to chase them behind them. They were in an impossible situation. They called on the Lord. God said, I'm going to show you something great. I'm going to show you something mighty because today you're going to cross on dry ground. Only and only and only I can take you through the Bible and show you how God does miraculous things whenever you never thought they could be done. But why don't you just look at your own salvation and look at how one day you were dead and you were going to hell and you had no hope. You had no way of saving yourself. You were like that little bird flapping your arms and then God showed you something great. God showed you something mighty, something you'd never seen before. He did something in you you couldn't do for yourself. And he's done it every day since. This young man who poked his head out of the tent. And he looked at him and he said, Master, what are we going to do? Elijah said, Oh God, 
I just want to open his eyes for just a minute so that he can see just how powerful you are. And tonight, he's wanting to open our eyes and he's wanting us to see once again just how powerful he can be in your life because he opened his eyes at that moment. Beforehand, all he seen was his problems. All he seen was the troubles. All he seen was the enemy pressing down on him. And maybe you're going through some things in your life and it's like the only thing you can see right now is your physical problems, your financial situation, your struggling marriage, your struggling career. All these bad things are going on but God said tonight I'm going to open your eyes for just a minute and when this young man's eyes were open just beyond the horizon of all of his problems just beyond the horizon of the enemy God had already had a legion of angels he already had chariots of fire he already had everything he needed and can I just tell you something tonight God's already got the answer to whatever problem you're going through just over the horizon. He said, I will supply all your needs according to your riches and glory. Maybe you got security problems. God's got your confidence. Maybe you just got worrying problems. God's got your courage. Maybe you're going through financial crisis. God's got the goods. God's got whatever you need to know. Just haven't been able to see it until now. So if you're here tonight and that's you, why don't you come and call on her? Why don't you place those hands? so much again for this day you've given us. Father, we thank you for being so great and so powerful in our lives. Father, I just pray that you'd help us now, Lord, as we go our separate ways. 
We thank you once again that you've allowed us this time together in your house of worship on Lord. And Father, I pray that you be with us all in our separate ways. Continue to guide us, protect us, and keep us safe. 